So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you, Alistair. And uh, we move on to our uh, conversation with Gikas Arduvelis, who's uh, familiar to you in this conference, but also brings um, multiple distinguished pers pers uh, perspectives to this, to this uh, topic as a distinguished uh, economist, author of many uh, econometric papers, as a former finance minister, and of course now as a banker chairman uh, of the board of uh, National Bank of Greece. Um, we're going to look at the macro picture above all. Uh, and I, let's start with the first bullet point actually of the, of the session, thinking about the European financial landscape in, in times of turmoil. Certainly turmoil is, is, is what it is. Do you think a recession is now almost inevitable? Is it baked in? Are your models blinking red to you, or what? Well, Dan, thank you. Uh, I mean, one does not have a crystal ball when it comes to forecasting. No. Uh, however, what we do see is a substantial uh, deceleration of economic activity. Everybody knows this. Uh, global GDP uh, in 2021 was like 5.8%. It's going to go down to 3%, and about half of it is due to the war. It was already there before the war started. Uh, and I guess the question about in, uh, a recession is a question for year 2023, the last quarter of 2022 and later. And it, it will be a function of, of the developments of the war, I think. Um, since you mentioned econometrics, uh, my favorite uh, guide is the yield curve. Uh, this is research I've done uh, 30 years ago, and it has never failed in the predictions of recession, which is the difference between the 10-year yield and the three-month rate. Uh, if in, uh, in two quarters in a row it's negative, then the recession is coming. Uh, now it's not showing recession, this particular uh, number. Uh, of so, course... So, so just, I, I just yeah. want to be clear on that since it's an important... Yeah. Bit. So, so you say it's never failed. Does that mean that when it's two quarters negative, uh, there's it, always been a recession? But does it also mean that if it doesn't show that, there isn't a recession? Yeah, well, uh, yeah, yeah. Is there, this it, is it, it's very, yes, yes. Because it's very rare that the yield curve does turn negative. And uh, the times when it was negative and it was not a recession, it was close to a recession anyway. Okay. So... Uh, since that particular number is not negative, I'm less worried. Of course, there's always a probability of recession. I mean, professional forecasters think there is 35% probability in the US that we will have a recession. In Europe, they say about the same, 33% probability. And nobody can tell because we don't know uh, how drastic the reaction of the central banks will be. And everybody's nervous about this. We heard this morning that they may overreact because they were too late in their response. They were too comfortable. They thought they were very credible and they had established uh, that the market believed them and they will stick around the 2% target, et cetera, et cetera. And it seems like they ran behind the curve. They were behind the curve. So that's, we need to follow them and see how, how they respond. And also, the attitude they have. Are they willing to sacrifice growth in order to fight inflation or not? Yeah. And, I, and I'd say, because I also lived in the 1970s, I, I still remember Jimmy Carter, for example, in, in the late 70s, proclaiming, addressing the nation, and saying uh, inflation is the moral equivalent of war. And uh, lo and behold, Paul Volcker actually did it for him. Uh, but at the cost of a recession, yeah, was, the cost of a big... It was very painful. Yeah, very it, was, painful. it was very painful. Now, this time around, I think we're a little bit better off relative to the 1970s. And uh, that's because advanced economies are not as sensitive to petroleum and to energy. They're not, the, ener the, the, the GDP is not so energy intensive as it was 40 years ago. Central banks we may 
accuse them, we may nag about them, but I think they are in a lot better shape than they were 40 years ago. They are more independent than they were 40 years ago. They have their act together, I believe. I mean, we can always nitpick on them, but I think they're doing a good job. And finally, we're still at a very early stage. Uh, we, we, now we're at the unanticipated inflation where all of a sudden we're finding out. The question is, will it enter into our expectations about the future and will this affect wages? Will, will it enter the wage, uh, pri will it become a wage price spiral as it hap had happened 50 years ago and it took a big effort to fight it? I think there is another element that makes it unlikely, which is uh, I th the workers are not as united anymore as they used to be. I mean, across, not only in the U.S., the U.S., there were 20% of them were, were unionized, now it's only 10%. In, in Italy, 50% of them were unionized, now it's like one-third. Everywhere, somehow, uh, everybody became too comfortable with the low inflation level, even at, 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 at the level of wage negotiations. Everybody believed there's, there's not going to be inflation. Remember about the, this affected interest rates, and everybody said, my God, we're having low interest rates, low f for longer. This was the buzzword a year ago or a, uh, two years ago. So uh, we just entered uh, this, this, this big uh, a new phase. Um, the people and the households are a little bit more worried than professional forecasters or uh, the central bankers about inflation, because they feel it. I mean, if you look at the surveys that the ECB is doing, you will realize that, uh, and they ask them, what's the rate of inflation in the last 12 months? And we know what the rate of inflation was, for example, uh, two months ago. It was like 6% the last two months. Well, they say, the most rich, they say 8%. The more poor, whose pocket is affected more, they say 12%. So everybody perceives inflation based on their experience, and households do perceive it. Unanticipated inflation helps debtors and hurts households and people's on fixed income. So just to play devil's advocate a little bit for you, I, mean, I won't go on to the central banks because we had that discussion this morning. I think yes. Mohamed El Arian was less um, uh, confident than you in the, in the central bankers, but leave that aside. Yeah, Le I, I'll say he's, oh. he's watching the stock market and he doesn't like it. I mean, he wants the stock market to be, you know, but anyway, let's leave it. Okay, let's, but let's move on from that. Just on the question of the, of, of, of the response in wage negotiations. It's of course true that unionization is much lower, organized labor is less powerful than it used to be, but isn't it possible that you get a sort of dynamic emerging for precisely the reasons that you say, that, that you know, people, ordinary households are feeling this, they sense it, and therefore the pressure for wage negotiations could become much stronger than people have experienced really for many years, and you start to get, if you're a union and you see all the other unions uh, uh, striking, you perhaps yes. become more militant oh, as well. Of course, no, it, it can easily happen. That's why it's critical that inflation is prevented in its beginning. Uh, remember, uh, it, could be, it, it could be a supply-driven inflation, but it could become uh, expectations-driven inflation if it's allowed to stay for a while. And, uh, and I think, although central bankers are not old enough to remember the 1970s, some of them, you know, realize it and, and they'll fight it off. So, so it leads, I think, no, and this is not just for central bankers, this is for, for economic policymakers yes. more broadly. What is the art of the possible to address the very real concerns of households in this difficult situation to try to support, particularly in, in, in uh, the energy uh, area, but more broadly as well? What can you do that both alleviates concerns but does not set off an inflationary yeah, spiral? I think it's targeted measures. Uh, at least the Greek government is doing that. It's trying to, it's trying to alleviate the burden, uh, especially on the poor households. So, I mean, I, I think uh, governments are quite sophisticated even today. Even the, the Greek government is quite sophisticated. They have learned their lesson from their previous crisis. 
and, and they're following a correct path. So what would you be targeting? You would target about those vulnerable households, particularly. Vulnerable so households. Pensioners in particular, yes. the, uh, those on the, on the lowest yes. income. And, you, and, and perhaps small companies that energy, for, in Greece, the energy cost yeah. is way too high, yeah. higher than in Europe. But, but I guess we shouldn't talk only about Greece. This is an international. Phenomenon. Well, I wanted to talk. I wanted to separate things actually between the the, the, the global, the, the European, and the uh, and the Greek, because the, the outlook. You know, usually in this conference, we're talking about a situation or an outlook in Great Greece, which has been um, particularly problematic compared with the uh, the rest of Europe. This year, we're looking at the opposite. The Greek situation seems to be better than for many countries. Which is, which is a pleasant situation to be in. The Greek situation, I mean, for the government, it, inflation is great because inflation, the debt to GDP is going to be reduced. I expect at the end of 2022 the debt to GDP to go down from 193% to lower 170s. Yeah, a little bit of inflation is a good yeah. thing. A little bit of inflation is a yes. good thing. You don't want infl the unanticipated inflation to become anticipated. Right. Uh, so that, that, that's the trick. Uh, you don't want it for too long because then it's going to really affect the population. It's going to affect everybody, and it's not good. So I wanted to ask you about the dependencies between the U.S. policy in the U.S. and Europe, and then Europe and Greece. So if we, uh, you know, if 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 the if the Fed gets it wrong, um, how possible is it for Europe to avoid? catching this cold that would be, uh, that would be uh, started in America. Uh, yeah, the Fed got it wrong. I, I, I was surprised that, uh, uh, that uh, President Biden had an expansionary fiscal policy right in the beginning after Trump already had an expansionary fiscal policy. And a lot of people in the Democratic Party, including Larry, Larry Summers, I remember, complained about it. Um, the Fed got it wrong. Uh, even the hawks uh, at the Fed I heard them, they tried to justify uh, the Fed being behind the curve. They said, but we have forward guidance. Yes, we know we're behind, but we have told the market what we do. And so far, they're okay when it comes to five years ahead. Uh, I mean, that inflation is more or less anchored. It only, you know, the, the, the target is 2%. It has only gone up to like 2.4%. So the, the problem is the next 12 months. And the, and, and, and the fear is that we, uh, we underestimate that if we don't catch that 12 month inflation early on, it may enter into the wage price spiral we were discussing. Yeah. So, so the Fed now, the fear is it may be too aggressive, it would have to be aggressive. Usually the Fed is a lot more aggressive than the ECB. The ECB turned out to be more prudent. Uh, it's uh, kind of uh, com being composed of 19 countries, I guess you get different points of view. Uh, you end up following the right path, I think. Uh, uh, they have struggled with these questions. We had uh, the Eurozone crisis, so they're, they're more ready, I guess. So within that, what's the margin for, for maneuver for Greece? I mean, obviously, you know, buffeted by, the, great, by, by the, the power of the U.S. economy and then within the Eurozone, uh, much less maneuver than there would have been in times past. But what, what can Greece do to, to, to gird itself the, against the, this? Greece should follow a credible policy. That's very important. We learned this lesson from the crisis. And I think uh, policy is credible. Uh, Greece now is composed of households who understand the problem of the state sector, that the state cannot simply give out goodies if they, if they want. Uh, they have companies that have survived uh, the deep recession. We as bankers have noticed that, for example, in the beginning of COVID, uh, when the government was giving out a lot of uh, support and a lot of privileges, uh, like uh, Gefira 1, Gefira 2, Bridge, whatever, a lot, a lot of our customers who had borrowed money from us, although they could have gotten the extra money from the, from the state sector, they didn't bother. And we didn't see NPEs going up. We're following NPEs now, we're following them every day. We have the number, the weekly number, and they haven't gone up. So, uh, in fact, we're going through the summer now, 
Uh, tourism is doing great. So I don't expect any problems. If anything, we will really see if things turn sour, we're going to start feeling it only in the fourth quarter and afterwards. Okay, well, and hopefully by then, uh, the politics with uh, Ukraine may have uh, uh, solved themselves. And, uh, well, let's and hope we'll for that. But, but I, 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 I'm pleased to hear your, your optimism on, on the Greek um, economy and the management of the Greek economy. Our, our time is now um, virtually up, so I just want to return to your, um, put your economist hat on. I want to ask you, what, what do you follow particularly closely now? Which, which maybe two or three indicators do you look at most avidly? You, you mentioned the yield curve. I'm sure you still look at that. Sure. But what, what, just as a hint for the rest of us okay, in I, this room, what should we be looking at? I, follow, I do follow economic sentiment. It's still positive. Uh, the PMI is above 50. It's declining, but it's still above 50, which means there is optimism among companies. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I follow everything. I mean, I... <laughs> <laughs> Difficult but, to follow everything. Yeah, but the... Well, you know, I, 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 what, what I do is I follow what the different chief economists of the various banks say. They tend to be, to tell you the truth, a lot more optimistic than our central bank is. Uh, for some reason, our central bank is more optimistic about 2023 than 2022. And the private economists are worried about 2023. And not so, they think the inertia will bring a lot of growth in 2022. And you heard the finance minister being sort of deliberately cautious in, in, in his the forecast. On. It's amazing. I, I, we were talking about credibility, a sign of how uh, credible now the government has become. The finance minister is one of the most pessimistic forecasters. <laughs> it's unbelievable, which is okay for him because he has to run, he has to make sure he, the rest of the ministries are not overspending. So he's the policeman of the, of the government. So that's his role. So he has to keep expectations low. So that, that's how he will well, be successful. Well, I'm going to let you into a little secret here of who I follow religiously. And that is my colleagues at the Economist Intelligence Unit, who, of course, are not professionally optimistic or pessimistic. They're professionally realistic. So that's why I'm going to hand over now to Joan to take us through into the last uh, session. But thank you very much. I've enjoyed that conversation, as yes. I'm sure everybody else has. Thank you. Else has. Thank you.